Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast. If you're not already, we would really appreciate it. If you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify, those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. I'm Andy Milburn. Jason Lyons. Dimitri Tacos. Hello. Hey, Deed. So today, uh, I think we've got, you know, unfortunately, lots of action in the in the Middle East to talk about. You want to kick off uh, about the, the strike in Damascus yesterday? Yeah. I mean... Everyone pretty much saw what happened already now. I mean, Israel's kind of kind of brazen airstrike on the uh, Iranian consulate that's like right next door to the Iranian embassy, which is also right next door to the Canadian embassy, uh, killing seven, you know, IRGC. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, uh, look, this was the, you know, I'll jump to the chase. This was the most significant strike that the Israelis have conducted on Quds Force like ever. Um, the top three field commanders within Quds Force were killed. I'll say that again, the top three field commanders. Um, Hussein Aminullah, uh, who was, who was, uh, he was chief of staff for Syria and Lebanon. And then uh, Rahimi, Haj Rahimi, who's a, you know, to say a, a, a Quds Force guy is controversial. Well, Rahimi's particularly controversial because his mandate is Palestine, right? And so uh, it, a lot of discussion about whether he knew about these attacks, whether he was involved in them or not. The Israelis were convinced that that uh, that Hamas did at least inform him, inform that attacks were coming. They may not, Hezbollah and Iran may have not realized the scale uh, but nevertheless, uh, soon became aware of them and reinforced them 100%. So this is kind of revenge for that. Um, and the third guy, uh, I'm, the third guy killed, um, General Zahidi, all right, the Israelis call him Madavi. Uh, he's actually, he's a former head of all Quds Force in uh, Syria and, and Lebanon. And he is... Uh, He's actually rumored to be Carney's successor. Carney is, of course, um, the uh, the head of Coups Force. So very, very significant. I'll pause there, guys, to see if you have any questions. Yeah, I was going to, sorry to drag you back to the beginning, but for those who don't know, can you uh, give a little background on what Coups Force is? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, this term gets used a lot. So, look, um, just by way of creds, <laughs> Okay, this doesn't make me an expert, um, but I'm one of probably one of the few uh, U.S. military guys. I would venture, perhaps the only one um, uh, since, aside from the hostages, who who spent time in an Iranian jail. Okay, and now I've got to qualify that very brief period of time being questioned by the um, uh, Revolutionary Guard, as they were called then, back uh, soon after, well, you know, eleven years after the revolution, the beginning of the war with. Um, with uh, Iran. I was in Tehran, taken off a bus and, and questioned by them. Um, again, that doesn't make me an expert, but it does. Uh, it, it, it removes or any, any reservations I may have about what an evil organization they are, um, uh, because many other people at the time were disappearing. Anyway, cut to the chase. Um, the, the Revolutionary Guards, uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, to give it its full title, you hear, hear it referred to as the IRGC. I uh, think of them as kind of, um, you know, the, uh, the the Islamic Revolution's version of the Republican Guard. Uh, you know, the every revolution has a a small group of the Jacobins and the French Revolution, a small group of activists, and the, the Revolutionary Guard were that, and they then became the de facto. Um, 
administration regime of Iran backing up the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, who became the Supreme Leader in 1989. So you see now, you know, a lot of these guys are kind of the same age as uh, me and uh, and Jason, you know, old enough to be Dee's grandfather. Um, <laughs> and they, but they were students, you know, in the 70s, back in late 70s. Uh, you know, you name it, Ahmed Dimajad, uh, Hussein, um, Hrinta <laughs> Soleimani, sorry, I'm trying to remember his name, all of these guys. And now they're at the top of uh, the Iranian uh, rank structure. Now, Quds Force is kind of a subdivision of the IRGC. And they are focused, they are, uh, you know, they, 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 well, they've been classified as a terrorist organization uh, by the uh, U.S. State Department with good reason. But Quds Force is responsible for the Iranian regimes, operations overseas, which they conduct primarily through the use of proxies, uh, such as Hezbollah, such as quite improbably Hamas, and I say improbably because Hamas is, of course, a Sunni organization, mm. but the Iranians were happy to hold their nose in this case and support Hamas, and then subsequently leave them out to dry because Hamas is doing their bidding. And as long as it is Sunni Arabs and Israelis being killed, this all plays very well to the Iranians. But now they've lost three of their top guys. Uh, there's, they have to take action. Mm. And, you know, and this is... This is uh, what is causing concern, obviously, within Israel now. Uh, the, this comes amidst massive demonstrations against Netanyahu. It is, uh, many feel, a, 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 well, they, I mean, it's hard to deny it's an escalation. Many feel that there are political motives for this escalation, that it is, you know, that, uh, that Netanyahu, if he can really really uh, solidify um, or, or continue down this polarization path and and uh, continue this campaign, rally the right behind him, um, get the patriotic and, 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 and kind of the Jewish vote. Uh, he, he will take this, you know, to the hilt. And that is what's worrying the vast uh, majority of Israelis right now who don't feel that this is the ticket that they bought when they uh, when they subscribe to the war on Hamas, um, over to you, uh, back over to you guys. You got anything, Dean? Yeah. So, like, I, my understanding is like Quds Force is basically like an IRGC is how Iran can kind of project their they, power because they, like they don't really have a military that's strong that, enough. That's so right. Like that's right. And and it's masterful because they are you know think of all the bumbling efforts we make to to build advisor type units uh, right both in the army and the US marine corps a very ad hoc um group of people and it's not considered a very it, you know, one of the things we've always struggled with conventional forces is they want to operate as battalions and brigades and divisions uh but not training foreign indigenous troops that is so unsexy right but that that is the core of gray zone operations and I'm using that term I know but that is the that's conflict everyone mm. uses proxy everyone's doing it mm. you know and we should get on board the Mozart group was a perfect opportunity guys you all missed it um <laughs> but so Kutz force are very adept at getting uh at, at working with proxies you know they live uh they live in the country uh they they work with they work closely with them. They I'm not saying for a moment that they identify with them. They mm. use them. They're, they're tools, but they do it very well, very well indeed. And so with just a small, relatively small group of people, you know, Kuds Force, just a few thousand guys, uh, they can conduct operations that are having a catastrophic, not a catastrophic, but but a, a, a global effect. Think about what the Houthis are doing that we've talked about here. Um, Hamas is the least capable of all of uh, Quds Force's proxies. Mm. Hezbollah is the most capable. And that is what everyone is worried about now, because Iran won't declare a war in Israel. Iran's not going to strike back in the same way. But using Hezbollah, uh, Iran certainly has the ability to to inflict in, in serious damage on Israel. Uh, and it's a question of math. It's a question of math, precision fires. Uh, Hezbollah has an arsenal now, many times the size of the one that it had in 2006, and even then uh, was able to overwhelm um, uh, Iron Dome. I'll pause there to see, see if you guys have any questions. It's a really 
And it's a really uh, this this is a very interesting, important, and quite scary inflection point. Mm. And so, Kuds is, uh, and this is my own ignorance, has always been a hands off force, or have they ever uh, been in direct? Well, um, they combat. Well, they 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 are occasionally involved in in. Uh, I mean, they are involved. You know, I mean, they they absolutely. Um, they, you know, they don't have this, uh, they don't have this artificial division between advise and assist and a company, right? No, of course. I mean, they, but, but the point is they don't need to, they, they do what they need to do to set the example, to rally uh, support. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, you know, for, for instance, if in, in Gaza, in Gaza, um, Israeli intelligence, not officially, but Israeli intelligence claims that they're picking up Farsi in Gaza, a Quds Force guys um, helping direct Hamas operations. All right. Uh, and that is the sort of help that they, they will give, um, you know, right up to, yeah, the, right up to to the X. Mm -hmm. um, but but the point is, they, they, there's always, and you know this, of course, Jason, there's always kind of a, um, it always, they always give Iran the plausible deniability, yeah. right? Um, and that is their strength. You know, I mean, it's a, it, it, Kuz Force is a masterful organization in that sense. It, it is a, it's very competent, very efficient. They have their fuck ups, some quite hilarious fuck ups at times. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, they, they mean business and they do business, you know, and uh, this is a very rare successful strike because they are very good at field craft. Gotcha. Um, by the way, just getting news from the Israelis, and I think this was reported on U.S. media, Hussein Yusuf, who's a senior Hezbollah official, also killed in the strike. So you've got guy and and an official from PIJ. Um, and What's so it PIJ? As, um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad who are involved in the fighting in Gaza uh, in support of Hamas. So that prob that strike... I'm going to go out on a limb and say that those names were known before that uh, that was um, carried out or yeah, was hot, maybe hot. like, a you know, I, yeah. I'm sure some of them at least, but I'm going to venture to say, given the, the names and the stature that it was known, all the names on that target were known. Yeah, a absolutely. The, I mean, these guys, the, these guys would have been, Top of the target list. I mean, they, they. I'm sure. I'm sure they're on their own target list too. Uh, and and so and and that's a really good point, Jason. Because you know how it is when something happens, everyone assumes that the proximate cause is something that happened right before that. Um, I'll give you the case in point. All right. So the the destruction. Um, there was a drone attack on Elat. You know, two days ago, and then. Right after this, the strike on Damascus. Well, you don't throw together strikes that easily, you know. I mean, they, this had been planned, um, and they were just waiting for for a uh, for a reason. And the reason was probably, as you know, the the time, location, um, the trigger, which had nothing to do with retaliation for any other event. How often do you get these seven individuals in a room? It would have been a high level decision, obviously. Um, but it just seemed probably like too juicy a target to pass up. But exactly. now, you know, um, as we've all seen, these targeted killings, they they rarely have a good effect. Mm. It's a long term. Yeah, that was my rarely. question. They, like we all we all feel good. Oh, great, but you name it, you know. Yeah, like what is gets the, followed by someone worse? What does the blowback look like now, like after these guys have been taken out and stuff like that? Like, what's yeah. a response from Iran look like? Is it just through Hezbollah? Like yeah, I, I would guess the risk. They, I mean, first of all, there has to be a response um, to uh, yes, uh, Hezbollah because, they, but it won't just be Hezbollah. There will probably be renewed drone attacks on southern Israel uh, from the Houthis. Uh, but certainly, yeah, this is yeah. You know, what would be interesting is um, to know what the discussion is that is taking place now between Nasrallah and Khomeini. You know, Nasrallah. Uh, by the way, Nasrallah, Hassan Nasrallah is the head of Lebanese Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this this warrants a whole show by itself. But the hey, bottom line is Nasrallah is, he's not a Lebanese patriot, but he's not, certainly not 
an Iranian stooge either. He is about himself and he's about Lebanese Hezbollah. And the problem with inciting a war with Israel is that it un it sets him back in time, right? He's he's got a plan, and his plan is that you know the state of Lebanon becomes essentially Hezbollah's state, and he's he's a long way along that path. We've talked about this when you look at members of the you know the cabinet there, you look at the um, the problems the military is having with Hezbollah infiltration. Um, all of these things. So he's almost there. He has built up his arsenal, which was uh, devastated in the 2006 award. He's he's built it up to a point where, um, yeah, it you know when you, we talk existential threat and very nearly existential threat. I mean, not existential, but um, can can certainly has the has the capability to inflict tens of thousands of casualties on the Israeli population. But to do so. Yes, he will become a global hero, but Hezbollah will take a schwacking. The Israelis were uh, stumbling um, sometimes, who well, have been stumbling when it comes to targeting in Gaza, but they have everything in Lebanon dialed in. They've had 40 years literally to do this. All right. They cannot hit all the targets. They don't have enough ammunition to hit all the targets, but they will try. And that is what Nasrallah knows. And the backlash um will probably go against Hezbollah. Uh, and so he, he he's walking a fine line. He wants, you know, he senses that the, you know, the Arab streets, but you know, on the uh, Shia side, uh, everyone is really outraged. This this level of anger in the Arab world, I don't we haven't seen it in our lifetimes. Uh, and it's easy to overlook it from where we are, but it but it is uh, it it is it has gathered a momentum that is quite uh, frightening. Nasrallah realizes that. So now he's caught, and the Israelis have just pushed the Iranians, right, into kind of uh, openly having to, to demand retribution. So everything seems set for a Hezbollah strike into Israel. I'll, I'll pause there for a moment. Uh, given everything you just said, do you think there's a, uh, it's plausible that Nasrallah would say no? That, you know, if he's told, hey, we need you Ooh, to... Uh, that's. That's the $10 million question, Jason. And the answer is no one knows. Not even, you know, if you talk to Israeli intelligence guys who have kind of, who have lived Nasrallah for their entire careers, and there are guys like that uh, and women, and and they will tell you they don't know. You know, he is, uh, Nasrallah is, um, he's a very, very smart guy, uh, but he also plays his cards quite close to his chest. That's why he's still alive. Um, we don't know. We don't know. And, and everyone, since this kicked off, I say everyone, but, you know, all the pundits have been asking, will he say no to Iran? Does he have enough Wasta power confidence by himself to do so? Um, and, and we will see. Um, and so, you know, as things go ahead, a number of other things uh, taking place too. The, this morning there was an attack on well, first of all, you know, relations between Israel and the United States are the worst that they have ever been. Um, again, you know, I stick to facts on this show. The, for the first time ever, guys, polls are showing the U.S. population, public um, disagree with uh, with what something that the Israelis are doing, foreign policy, how they're handling uh, Gaza. All right. Um, and. You know, there's Netanyahu snubs to the president. Uh, Netanyahu is banking on a Trump victory. But then Trump the other day said, hey, Israel just needs to finish this. You know, he seemed impatient. Of course he is. The Republicans don't understand. I mean, the, the Republicans don't want this probably going on either. My point is uh, that everyone realized that this is severely damaging to the U.S. Uh, prestige or um, view in the world. And we don't have a lot of wasa to depend on right now, and we're being dragged into the toilet. That's one argument. Uh, but it's hard to argue against, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to do, you know, and then the world... But at the kit. same time, at the same time, we're giving them, you know, $18 billion in military aid. Yeah, what's it, $3.6 billion a year, you know. And, no, but and, they're giving, like, the new aid package, right, of 18... Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 And, if the, you know, the point is, but we have been giving them three point, you know, sure. billions of dollars every year. And um, there was a very funny Saturday Night Live sketch in Israel. They've got their version of Saturday Night Live 
um, where, you know, they've got this guy playing Netanyahu and he's like, no, tell the goyims to fuck off, you know, <laughs> tell them, you know, tell them to take that three, you know, $3.6 billion and shove it up their ass, you know. It, so this was kind of a realization among a segment of the Israeli population who have close ties with the United States, who we don't want to alienate the United States. Um, right. We feel more in the kin with the United States than with Israel. Um, and then you get this World Food Kitchen strike, okay? Seven killed, um, US, Canada, Australia, Poland, and the United Kingdom, aside from the usual Palestinians, all right? Whichever way you look at it, um, his, you know, his, his, what the news uh, is reporting that the convoy uh give me a second um that it was that it was coordinated uh that the yep the coordinates were set in blah 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 um but it was still struck the Israelis said that they were investigating initially they said that it was uh operating outside curfew in an area not coordinated but now they apparently are According Full to of shit. the latest, yeah, admitting that yes, it was coordinated. So, so here's another um, uh, a potential rift between the U.S. and and Israel. You know, I mean, none of us like the thought that uh, Israel or any country can kill our citizens without without even asking. You know, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I mean, <laughs> because if they'd asked, we'd have said, "No, you fucking cannot kill right. that guy. He's working for the World Food Kitchen." By the way, you know, I, another um. Uh, insight I have here is uh, having having driven you know food uh, humanitarian assistance under bombardment for the World Food Kitchen. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not completely unbiased in this uh, in this story. Any any questions on that? Well, and I mean, then, like, uh, I think it's uh, okay to not be to uh, be a little biased because they killed fucking aid workers. They didn't kill like you know. Hamas guys hiding in a hospital that like, you know, where that's what they do. No, it was aid workers. It was clearly marked. It was coordinated. What are we doing? I mean, you know, it's supposed to be the best military in the world. And I get it's war and it's a fucking disaster and it's mayhem and it's chaos. But like, do yeah. they even give a shit about how like the world, honestly, the United States perceives them? Or are they just going to keep doing like what they're going to do? And that's that. Yeah. Um. I'm going to ask you your, your question, D, just very quick. Uh, just there's some more stuff coming in. Sure. Uh, so the uh, despite despite court, this is coming from the World Food Kitchen, uh, Aaron Gore, CEO. Despite coordinating movements with the IDF, the convoy was hit at his, as it was leaving Darul Bala Warehouse, where the team had un unloaded more than 100 tons of humanitarian food aid brought to Gaza on maritime route. Reports are that it was hit actually three times. Um, from Aaron Gore, this is not only attack against World Food Kitchen, attack on humanitarian organizations, yeah, blah, blah. Um, hit three times. What happened? They didn't get it right the first two. I don't know. Who knows? Wait, anyway, the you know, we'll see. I'm not, I'm not dismissing. I'm saying this is, yeah, this is, this is serious. It seems almost as though Netanyahu is not Netanyahu is doing, but bridge burning things, right? And if you've seen the movie Wag the Dog. You might be thinking along those lines. It's quite concerning. But what's the but, uh, what's what's the play? Like, what's the strategy in doing that? To not have any allies left? Oh no, no, no! To to Netanyahu, it this all makes uh, this this all makes perfect sense. Um, by the way, Israel has Israel. I don't know if I mentioned they haven't accepted their responsibility for the Damascus site, but it you know it does it does make sense. So you think about it. Um, you push Iran into war. Uh, you recover Gaza, all right, for the state of Israel, which is what, which is what uh, Netanyahu's base is pushing for to colonize Gaza and make it part of Israel. You know, that's that's the dog whistle uh, piece. You know, in the background here, but it's it's quite openly discussed among the members of uh, uh, it, uh, of the right wing in Israel. Um, so he's going to satisfy. The Israeli extremists, um, the ultra orthodox, uh, who are also, by the way, you know, calling on him to destroy Al Aqsa and rebuild the temple. You know, I mean, I'm wondering where this is going to end. But the, the ultra orthodox who don't fight either. Exactly, and that is also causing internal problems in Israel. They call, you know, they uh, they are they're good at beating up or shooting. You know, reportedly, this is the argument. Okay, um, from from many in Israel. 
hey, these guys push us to the brink of war. They cause problems with the Palestinians. And yet they don't have to deal with the consequences because they don't have to serve. Um, and Netanyahu who really has fought against um, removing that exemption. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, is, it, you know, has said that the, the exemption is no longer valid. Um, so Netanyahu is dragging his feet on how to implement this, saying it's going to take a decade to bring these guys into the military. So you can see um, how this resentment is building. Uh, sure. But they are Netanyahu's base. Uh, and and political survival was very very important to him, um, and 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 so dividing the world in this way in a way that it hasn't been divided since the early eighties over Israel and it's far worse than it was in the early early eighties is it makes perfect sense to him. Uh, he's driving away friendly you know I mean moderate friendly Arab countries such as Jordan. Uh, he's driving. I mean, he has he has antagonized the Arab street beyond all measure. So I think, you know, the real question here is, what else could he have done? What else could he? And and I, you know, I I've got some thoughts here. Um, and bear in mind, my thoughts are not from an armchair. Um, you know, I've I've had to deal with these problems for real. Um, and it, you know, there's a number of reasons why so many civilians are going to be killed. Underlying it all, frankly, uh, is it is a. I mean, in some cases, it's explicit. You know, by or it, you will protect your soldiers' lives at all costs, mm. and and implicit to that, on the never stated in an order is if that means a choice between killing many Palestinian civilians or having your own soldiers killed, then that's not a choice, you know? And so um, a lot of the things that that we do in the in the US uh, to do with proportionality or to do with um, uh, identification of uh, uh, discrimination, identification, all these things that we're familiar with are not the norm. Now, they use these terms, and I'll give you an example of how, how it goes awry. They do collateral damage assessments, but here, here is how it's done. First of all, the, their intelligence within Gaza is not that uh, is not that good, and it's not a fault of Israelis' intelligence. It's just Hamas has got really fucking good at operating without giving their presence away. Okay, so so a lot of the intel they're getting is based on drone uh, observations, um, and it's fleeting intelligence. So they feel like they have to make a decision very quickly. Um, and so they do, and they always err on the side of caution for themselves or their forces. Um, they will, and, and, and so it, it, one, one of the problems here is that the Israeli spokesman can say pro forma, Hey, here's what we're doing. And it is true. And, um, we have people, you know, and a guy like a guy I, I have great respect for, John Spencer at the Irregular Warfare Institute, goes to Israel, gets their brief, comes back, writes an article in Newsweek saying there's no no army in the world takes so many uh, measures to prevent civilian casualties. Well, John is a great guy, uh, greatest respect for him, but that is simply not true. Uh, John didn't, of course, didn't lie. Um, but he made a lot of statements without really looking behind. And I'll give you examples, okay? Collateral damage assessments are based on their intel, but their intel is not good. Um, and and they're under, and again, you know, the arbiter is always, uh, if you don't make this strike, are Israeli forces risk raised, okay? Um, that is it. It's, it's, it doesn't get into detailed proportionality. This isn't me just shooting, uh, you know, I'm getting this and from guys I've, I've spoken to. And in fact, it's in the, the papers in Israel too. Um, uh, so here's some, some quotes, all right, uh, from, from Israeli soldiers. In practice, the terrorist is anyone the IDF has killed in the areas in which its forces operate says an officer who served in Gaza. The feeling we had was there wasn't there weren't aren't any rules of engagement there, another soldier says. Okay. Um so what are the battles? What's the fighting looking like in Gaza? I mentioned the other day they they're taking lower casualties than we did in Fallujah. Good for them. Except that they're causing many, many thousands times the cas civilian casualties that we cause in Fallujah because in Fallujah we took a little bit more risk because we're Americans. We may call it what you will. It's try even if you disagree with it. I'm proud of the fact that we risked our own lives to save civilians. There is no such thought within the Israeli military. 
Um, and it, it, it's very, very firmly rooted in, in their belief, you know, their, their constant belief that Israel is under existential threat. Okay, Th those, are, those are kind of the facts. Um, and, and, you know, if anyone wants to challenge me on this, I'll give you, you know, by all means, please do. Please do. But remember, um, three Israeli hostages were killed. All right. They were shot. They were shot. They weren't killed in an airstrike. They were shot by Israelis even after. Here's what happened. Um, and, and this kind of bear, this isn't tearing open the people who did this. It's explaining why the problem is a policy. It's not individual actions. So when these three terror, these three hostages were killed, a drone was sent inside the building by the Israelis having great success using drones inside buildings. A drone flew into the building. Oh no, shit, sorry. It was a dog. They send in a dog um, and the dogs all have GoPros and the dog picks up these three Israeli hostages and they, they don't know the dog has GoPro, but they're yelling in, in Israeli and they're terrorists. Uh, there's a couple of terrorists in there, a um, couple of wounded ones. Um, the Israelis blow, destroy the house. They say, and who I don't disbelieve them, you know, the soldiers involved said they didn't check the GoPro camera. They, the hostage, um, uh, is the a GoPro, hostages, excuse me, is a GoPro camera a live feed or no? Yeah. Have, okay. Oh, uh, no, no, it's not live feed. Sorry. Okay. Um, but anyway, so the hostages, they're not killed, uh, in the house destruction. They get on the street. Um, two are sh subsequently shot by Israelis. And now it gets really bad. The third one runs back into a house. Israeli soldiers follow him in and shoot him there, close range. So I'm like, okay, the, you know, think about all, think about all the measures here that, you know, that we know rules of engagement that would have prevented that happening. Um, so when the Israelis said, hey, these guys weren't following policy, it's hard, it's hard to understand how so many guys didn't follow policy and the soldiers involved are saying that they were told to shoot anything that came into the area. And when you look at what happened, it's hard to believe it's hard not to believe them. Okay. And then, um, you know, other soldiers are saying, yeah, we had free fire zones. Um, whenever we set up a, uh, like a, a, you know, bivouac air, I mean, not a, a bivouac, we went firm, uh, but even moving during the day, we were told, shoot anything that came into our zone. Uh, we gave civilians two weeks to move. Um, and if they didn't move, you know, that's they, they, they're fair game. So um, now there's so many things that interfere with civilians being able to move in that environment. Uh, the messaging wasn't clear. The Israelis said they used roof knocking, which means firing a small caliber round, I mean, a smaller cal caliber bomb into the roof or rocket into the roof before you bomb the building. But, you know, there's a problem. There's a problem with communicating with lethal force, all right? It's not always clearly apparent. If you're in a building and the roof gets hit, you may probably just think, wow, that was a close one. You don't think, hey, this was a very kind warning that I'm about to be incinerated if I don't get out of this building. You have to, you know, I mean, it's it, it's almost as though they've got this, okay, we're going to go through this. Um, the the because their intelligence is not good, they they can't make good uh, estimates of uh, proportionality because they don't know the value of the units or organizations they're going after. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of things wrong with um, w with what is being said about um, uh, about or uh, about their procedures, and then and then as the shooting their own hostages uh, is, is concerned, you would think that that would cause them to reframe everything. But it hasn't because, again, there is this ethos. I mean, there's no doubt there's revenge underlying this, um, but that's speculation. I, I, there, there's got to be revenge in the back of the human beings involved in this. And this is why leadership is so important. But if you have leaders, I'm not saying this is happening, but it has happened in the US military. If you have leaders who are reconciled, just saying, hey, whatever, man, you know, um, if you feel at risk, uh, then by all means. And and so when you get a case like the uh, humanitarian convoy that was fired on and 100 killed, the Israelis say only percentage of the proportion of those were killed by the Israelis, but um, the hospitals saying that a large... Anyway, bottom line is definitely a um, number of incidents of people uh, lining up for food being shot by Israeli soldiers. Um, in every case their answer has been, I felt threatened, all right? And it seems once you utter those magic words, all bets are off. 
And we went through the stage too. So we can't feel too, you know, not as not not as extremely as this, obviously. I mean, can you imagine if we had caused 31,000 civilians deaths in any operation? Um, we would be facing criminal charges, frankly. Um, but uh yeah, I I represent, you know, look, I understand this is a brutal dilemma. Uh, but I I also uh speaking as someone who has fought house to house and has planned urban operations. I'll, I'll pause there, guys, if you in case you've got any questions. No, nah, man, you're the of the three of us, you're the uh the one with the most expertise on this. Um so I'm I'm listening, I'm learning as well, too. I'm sure we're gonna hear about it in the comments, but no, nah, don't um, worry about the comments. We're yeah. talking the truth. Exactly. So yeah, I'm learning. We don't have, we don't have a dog in this fight. Like I don't, at least like to be completely honest. I mean, I understand that Israel needs to like smoke Hamas people like Hamas leadership. I think they should have done it the wrong, the different way instead of sending like divisions. into Gaza. I'll give you another example. Okay. So in there and, and look, I, I, I was a fire support coordinator by military occupational speciality. And, you know, again, that doesn't make Stop me- Stop bragging. No, I, I'm just saying, because I'm, I want to preempt, um, you know, the, our favorite uh, contributors who pile in and, and uh, call me an, an idiot again, or I'm mm-hmm. alone. Uh, but I do know what I'm talking about. And I, you know, the point is um, that, for instance, when you, what the Israelis are doing, they're saying, hey, these are legitimate targets. Uh, because Hamas is operating out of, you know, this building, but the building is an apartment block. The Hamas are operating out of one or two apartments. This is a, this is a real case, by the way. This was, um, oh, crap. It doesn't matter. I'll get back to it. It, it was a building that was destroyed uh, in 2021. Uh, so they'll destroy the whole building. And if they're warning the occupants of that building by firing into the roof, uh, you can see the problem here. And if you've got an apartment block, and people are worried about walking on the streets because they're free, you know, free fire zones. It gets very difficult to be a civilian, right? You can't go out in the streets. But if you stay in the building, you're going to get killed. So, um, yeah, you know, you can say, well, is, is Netanyahu, meanwhile, saying Israel has the most moral army in the world. Um, that may be. No one's, you know, I'm not making comments about the the morality of the individual soldier. I'm saying that they, that, that the way things are set up, the policy, the procedures, uh, that their customs are such that nothing other than massive civilian casualties uh, could be anticipated. So it's fucked, is what that's the that's what we've realized. Well, I mean, like, where does it end? Because they're gonna go into Rafa and wreck some shit like there too. So where do all those civilians that moved away from Gaza City? Where do they go? What's the move? Does yeah. it matter to them? Doesn't seem yeah. like it from an idiot like me. It doesn't seem like it. Yeah. Well, that that's a it's just hard to see a good outcome or a, a peaceful outcome to this now. D and and the incidents of the last uh, the attacks in Damascus. Look, I I know. I mean, we went through this discussion with Soleimani. I, this it, Soleimani was one of my bags, baby. You know, when I was I wore uniform, I was delighted as a human being to see him dead. But I was concerned that it was not part of a synchronized campaign, right? And uh, I s- suspect that it may not have been. And the same thing here, okay? If the Israelis have something lined up to mitigate the backlash, that's good. If they don't, then. The jury's out on <laughs> whether this was a good move, right? But There's no way about, they have but anything. To your point ready about to, to your point about Rafa, uh, they, this is a this is as near a red line as I can see between the United States and Israel. All right, um, there was a, a point where Israel might have got away with saying, "Hey, look, we'll take care of the civilian population. We'll put them on the beach." Blah blah blah. Uh, but after the, you know, now it seems as though. With U.S. polls swinging against uh, Israel's actions, um, death of U.S. citizens in the last 24 hours is not likely to help that. I would say that the administration's really going to this today um, draw a hard line on on Rafa, on going into Rafa, because that Netanyahu has promised promised uh, the Israeli people that that's exactly what they are. Um, that's what we're doing, you know. So. 
All right, you know, to, I guess to kind of summarize what you know what I've been talking about, the 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 problem is that frankly, the IDF is not taking the trouble to distinguish between civilians and militants in Gaza. You know, the IDF would argue we just don't have time to take. You know, we don't we can't do any more than we're doing because it's going to put us in danger. Um, you know, the same time Israel's expanding its you know, during the Gaza operation, because at the beginning it had very few real targets. Well, they were all old, as you can imagine. They hadn't been tracking Hamas. Well, now they've got hundreds of targets, but you know how it is, and, you know, people move all the time and they're dropping dumb 2,000 bombs capable, you know, as everyone knows, well, not everyone knows, but people, they kill it, that's capable of killing, wounding people more than a, a thousand feet away from the impact, right? CEP is, what, a thousand feet for 2,000? Okay. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it, it's... So how can you possibly say uh, that when you're dropping dumb bombs in, in an environment like that after taking precautions like roof knocking um, or dropping leaflets and expecting people to move in that environment, how can you really uh, expect civilian casualties to be lower? Also, what I worry about a little bit is like, you know, like we've discussed in other other episodes you know the Ar iranian the quds force proxies all over the middle east whether they're in iraq or syria or wherever are you know kind of operating relatively independently and i don't really see them differentiating israel and america for the most part generally uh so like i see that there is you know risk to american personnel and bases whether it's baghdad airport or the embassy or whatever or Tower 22 or any of the other bases we have across the, the region. So what happens if we get hit again and we lose a couple servicemen again? We're brought back into it. We like in, in a more kinetic way. Like we need to step up and show like, hey, you don't do that. Here's a pee pee whack. Yeah, that's what I worry about. I know Iran doesn't want to drag Israel or the United States into a full fledged war because like their military is not great. I mean. That's why they use the cuts for so much is because well, it projects they, their power. They, they don't want to go to, to you know, state on state war. Sure. Um, they, this strike against Kutz force officers in that sense was very deliberately, very deliberately designed to give them no choice. Uh, but, right. to, you know, so um, Netanyahu, whatever he may say, is after escalation. Mm. And and there's something else, you know, this. remember I talked about the uh, Hannibal Directive uh last episode or two episodes ago you know this these these uh things going on murky things going on uh within the military that suggests that you know brigade and battalion commanders are making their own decisions on rules of engagement in fact that is um the overwhelming feedback i'm getting uh you know i, I spoke to one battalion that uh, moved in you know moved up north on uh, 7 october and they were weapons tight, you know, usual rules of engagement. Another battalion moved in after them, and they they were reconnaissance by fire. They were, you know, they would every morning and every evening they would fire the morning and evening hate, as it used to be called in the First World War, into the villages on the Lebanese side. And that was sanctioned by their commanders, you know, and this is within the same organization. There is no, there doesn't appear to be any central uh, rules of engagement. So the Hannibal um, doctrine was... Uh, directive um was an official thing um that authorized israeli soldiers to risk the lives of hostages in order to free them in other words you know knowing what lay in store for them you could accept a high level of risk okay common sense right uh it has been interpreted apparently as meaning you can kill hostages uh or your own soldiers to prevent them being kept uh held captive okay and that was the Hannibal Doctrine, there are incidents where uh, soldiers are claiming that the Hannibal Doctrine has been called um, by battalion brigade commanders. And then just, you know, I guess there's a lot of these code red type things. There's another thing called the Dahia Doctrine, uh, which was formulated in the 2006 Lebanon War. Apologies, the Dahia. Yeah. Um, so, so its main tenet it is that disproportionate attacks, including against civilian structures and infrastructure, are authorized, um, you know, for for achieving the end, and uh, and and that that is may well be what's at play here, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how like you could be 
you could justify this more and more as like e- even the United States government. Like it's like, dude, we c- I mean, there's only so much we could do. Right. And it's not even dividing the world. I mean, the world's pretty much on one side of this for the most part. You know, I think, you know, in terms of s- states, you know, and like countries, you know, they're, everyone's pretty much saying, hey, guys, let's chill out a little bit mm, yeah. and go back to what you're good at, which is assassinating top level people, the odd nuclear scientists. You know what I mean? Like, let's yeah. just do that. Yeah. You know, Netanyahu actually has yeah. not been a hawk. Uh, in the past, he's he's a little like he's going to love this analogy. Nasrallah, in the sense, he knows how to walk the line, right? You know, get everyone fired up, but avoid because uh, he knows he's a survivalist. He knows that entrenched conflicts like Lebanon lead to the end of careers. Um, and and <laughs> I mean, his career is undoubtedly over. The question is when. And he wants his perhaps he wants his career to end the other side of a war. Uh, a major war because that will extend, you know, that's the argument against him. So it's no longer at that point, longevity, it's legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or <clears throat> not even legacy, pres- <laughs> just preservation of power. Yeah. He's a political creature. Gotcha. Netanyahu. Yeah. You know, and, and he, he cut his teeth in the talk, in the uh, um, reality, not reality TV, the, you know, the talk show mm-hmm. uh, circuit. Here in the United States in the uh uh in the in the late seventies and eighties. That's what made him. Wow. Yeah, I mean legacy hunting or political preservation at the expense of tens of thousands of civilians and uh even Israeli soldiers and you know, just human death and destruction kind of makes you fucking evil, in my opinion. That's completely my opinion. If you like BB Netanyahu, congratulations. I don't. I think he's a fucking rat. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I state facts, you know, and I do express opinions, of course. Otherwise, I'd be very boring. Um, but yeah, I, I am concerned. I'm concerned for Israel. I'm concerned for the Middle East. I'm concerned for the world. I'm very concerned for the United States, most of all, obviously, right now. And um, I think it's important for everyone, everyone watching, to remember that. Never mind. I'm not even going to go down that route. <laughs> So anyway, hey, as we, oh, um, uh, here's hey, here's another thing on rules of engagement, okay? Uh, that that wasn't, you know, John Spencer didn't mention the Newsweek article. The Israelis go into every building shooting, um, for the most part, all right. And that is, you know, that's kind of the rest of, uh, SOP in Gaza. Um, uh, I'm not making a comment on right or wrong. I'm just saying. You know, that leads not just to huge, enormous ammunition consumption, um, which they don't have a problem with when it comes to small arms, because, you know, they're obviously logistics bylines. Uh, but the but but two, you know, that is something reconnaissance by fire, as it were, is something that we are never authorized to do in the US or seldom authorized to do, certainly not in those environments. Um, but that is that, you know, I look, no, frankly. Most civilians, vast majority of civilians are killed by artillery, um, you know, to kill fire zones. Um, relatively, relatively few, still hundreds, thousands probably, killed by direct fire. Um, but uh, so but so all of this, all of this is a problem. It's not particular procedures. It's the kind of the underlying culture. I think it's the best way to put this. I know I brought us near an end. No, that was Great perfect. Day. No, I was, I was great. I think... Uh... I think it's tough, man. I don't know. I don't know what well, the, we should say what goodbye. The right? Yeah. <laughs> no, Jay, I, I think. <laughs> no, man. I'm. Uh, you know me. I I like to learn, so uh, I had to sit back on this one and just listen and ask my little questions, and I appreciate it. That's what I do every episode. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's just for those interested in how you know how the what the fighting looks like in Gaza. Uh, I mentioned the Israeli casualties being remarkably low. You know, it's in the two hundred and I think fifties, low sixties, and you know, six months of six months. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, four to five months of fighting. Uh, that's extraordinarily low. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, one of the aside, we've talked about fires, but uh, after they have uh, plastered an area, then they'll send in their special operations guys who will seize a foothold, kind of a bridgehead, um, 
uh, or you know they'll send in drones, dogs uh, first, then they'll send his, um, their special operations forces to to hold a block, and only then will they send in their conventional forces. Um, and then it's a very very slow movement. I've been told you know a uh, couple of hundred yards a day. Um, it's, so you see, it's a very cautious, very deliberate. Uh, move. That's probably how they're saving their own casualties. Ballpark, Andy. How many uh, Hamas fighters are there? Like actually fighting every day? Yeah, that's a good question. So because I haven't seen that uh, anywhere. Yeah. So the Israelis say twenty to thirty thousand at the beginning. They say now. Remember last week I said fourteen to fifteen thousand. They're claiming killed. When you add up the battalions that they say they have killed, it's fourteen to fifteen thousand guys. Looking at Hamas's order of battle. Now Israel saying they've killed nine thousand Hamas operatives. Coincidentally, exactly the number of military age males killed, reported dead. Right, so <laughs> um, hard to tell. Right, um, really hard to tell. No one can. No one can tell you how many battalions are left in Rafa. Anyone who says they can is mm -hmm. full of shit. Yeah. I mean, even if you we had the best intel in the world, you know, you're talking about small groups of guys. And, and all the engagements there are, are small groups, um, you know, running around through tunnels in a densely, densely um, populated area. How can you possibly make a coherent estimate of how many people are there? I mean, how many fighters are there, let alone form them into battalions? Um, it's, it's ridiculously unrealistic. And as I've mentioned even even if you ignore the figures, uh, Western intelligence reports, the UK in particular, uh, I don't want to burn him, but he's he's particularly well positioned to know about this, is saying that Israeli reports of Hamas casualties are uh, very much over the mark. Mm -hmm. So there's very few silver linings. Yeah. And as we talked about, even if Hamas was completely obliterated, there are thousands and thousands of kids who have seen their families right there is no end them. game here let's go yeah there's no would, Come on. would you be happy the rest of your life would no you? dude yeah. not you a... seen your family i mean just fucking go up and smoke yeah would you say yeah hey, i was like oh i want to be secular and democratic yeah. oh yeah. yeah that's what i want to do I, if revenge is the one thing that life offered you that's what you would do and anyone you know out there who who thinks they're different i would love to hear from them mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like a, the zenish person in the fucking world. Yeah. All right, that's right. it. On that that's happy note, on that happy note, um, soon, probably not next week, because something exciting will show up. Soon we're going to talk about Taiwan, guys. And um, this is the opportunity for Dee to say, what was the phrase? Uh, I don't know. Non-consensual unification, which oh, always yeah. has him giggling. It yeah. reminds him of that. Uh, <laughs> it's my favorite. One of his favorite movies, Weekend at Rikers. <laughs> uh, but, but no, it's going to be a serious. No situation. comment. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay, don't, everyone. Don't forget yeah. to like and subscribe. If you're listening to us on audio, rate and review at five stars. Check out Andy's book. Check out Andy's Twitter. All the links will be in the description below. Patreon.com/slash the Team House is the best way to support these shows. You get ad-free audio. You can ask questions if you have any, even to eyes on. We will get to them. I promise you. Um, and yeah, it's just the best way to support the show because YouTube is not awesome right now. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, totally. Thanks, everybody. All right.